Hi, my name is John Hilton. Welcome to the Book of Mormon, a masterclass. This course is designed to take you from 1 Nephi 1 through Moroni chapter 10, over 52 classes, each of which will be about 30 minutes in length. I'm so excited to be in this course with you, and I have four major objectives for this course. First, I hope that you will come closer to Jesus Christ through seriously studying the Book of Mormon. Second, I hope that you'll better understand the doctrines, teachings, and storyline of the Book of Mormon. Some of these things will be basic and others will be new scholarly insights. Third, I hope that you'll learn new study skills that will increase your ability to gain spiritual insights in your personal scripture study. And finally, I hope that this course will help you live the teachings of the Book of Mormon. The Lord says in Doctrine and Covenant section 84 that church members need to remember the Book of Mormon not only to say, but to do according to that which I have written. It's good to talk about the Book of Mormon, but ultimately we need to live its teachings. And I hope that this course will help you do that. And along the way, I hope we can have some fun as well. So if you don't mind, I'd love to start by sharing a little story from my freshman year of college. This is a photo of my floor at Deseret Towers, my freshman year at BYU. You can see me staring off into space. I loved my freshman year. There were all sorts of fun things that happened, one of which was a dance called Preference. This was a girl's choice dance, and I thought it was a great idea to have a girl's choice dance until no one invited me to the dance. So I was feeling really discouraged. It was getting to be awkward. People would say to me, hey, John, who are you going with to the dance? And I'd be like, oh, I think I'm going out of town that weekend, which was a total lie because I didn't have a car and I had nowhere to go anyways, but I was just trying to save face. However, there was a magical day when I did get asked to preference. As I walked into the cafeteria, there was a giant sign posted. It said, John Hilton III, will you go to preference with me? Now, I don't know why sometimes in our culture, we have this like big thing when you ask someone to a dance, you know, she makes the sign. So I respond by filling her room with balloons and she responds by blowing up my bicycle. You know, it can get out of control. Not, not only was there the sign, there was also a rope and the rope led from the sign. And I was supposed to follow the rope to see who it was that had asked me to the dance. So I'm following along and there's these signs along the way. Hey, John, I can't wait to dance with you. And I was like, whoa, this is going to be amazing. The rope went back to my dorm building, up five flights of stairs, and into the men's bathroom, which I thought was kind of weird. And the rope led into a brown paper bag. So as I reached into the bag, I thought maybe there would be some chocolates, but instead there was a note. It said, ha ha, and was signed by Kai, the guy who lived next door to me. So thanks, Kai, wherever you are. Fortunately, after years of therapy, I'm able to laugh about this moment together with you. There's all sorts of crazy things that can happen during one's freshman year of college. But for me, what I remember even more than that prank was something that my then home teachers, or we might say today, ministering brothers, Jason and Seth, shared with me a couple of months after that preference debacle. It was early in the winter semester, and Seth and Jason came to my home, and they shared with me a message from President Ezra Taft Benson. President Benson said, there is a power in the Book of Mormon, which will begin to flow into your lives the moment you begin a serious study of it. You will find greater power to resist temptation. You will find the power to avoid deception. You will find the power to stay on the straight and narrow path. When you begin to hunger and thirst after those words, you will find life in greater and greater abundance. My ministering brothers invited me to seriously study the Book of Mormon. Now, for years, I'd had the habit of reading a chapter or two from the Book of Mormon each day, but if I was honest with myself, it was more of a read, not a serious study. So I decided to take my ministering brothers up on this invitation. And over the next few months, as I began to seriously study the Book of Mormon, I felt a closer connection to Jesus Christ. The promises that President Benson gave were fulfilled in my life. And even though my freshman year, the fall semester was so great, I found that in the winter semester, it was completely different. And the only thing that had changed was a serious study of the Book of Mormon. My hope, my overarching hope for this course is that you will draw closer to Jesus Christ through a serious study of the Book of Mormon. As President Russell M. Nelson taught, I promise that as you prayerfully study the Book of Mormon every day, you will make better decisions every day. I promise that as you ponder what you study, the windows of heaven will open and you will receive answers to your own questions and direction for your own life. I promise that as you daily immerse yourself in the Book of Mormon, 
You can be immunized against the evils of the day, even the gripping plague of pornography and other mind-numbing addictions. Take a moment and think about this question. What is the difference between reading the Book of Mormon and seriously studying it? There are lots of things that a person could do to move from a casual reading of the Book of Mormon to a serious study of it. Here are my top three tips. First, set aside a specific amount of time to read the Book of Mormon every day. And in my own life, I found that what works best is if I make it a matter of prayer. If in prayer, I can say to Heavenly Father, listen, I'm your 24-7 servant, and I want to do thy will. There's lots of priorities that I'm juggling. Can you help me know how much time I should block out each day for a serious study of the Book of Mormon? The amount of time has changed in my life at different times and seasons. But for me, knowing that I'm on the Lord's errand as I'm studying the scriptures, that he wants me to block out a specific amount of time has been really helpful for me. Consider what President M. Russell Ballard taught. He said, I have heard many well-intentioned church leaders and teachers instruct congregations to find time for daily scripture study, even if it's only one or two verses per day. Though I understand the point they are trying to teach and applaud the sincerity of that conviction, May I gently suggest that if we are too busy to read at least a few minutes every day in the scriptures, then we are probably too busy and should find a way to eliminate or modify whatever activities are making that simple task impossible. Now, obviously, President Ballard doesn't want anyone to feel guilty, and it's certain that we shouldn't turn a study of the Book of Mormon into a checklist item. For me, it's been helpful to make it a matter of prayer and then block out a specific amount of time to read the scriptures each day. My second tip is in some way, shape, or form, write down the things that you're learning. This could be keeping a scripture study journal, writing notes in the margins of your scriptures, taking electronic notes, or taking all the things that you're learning and turning it into a talk. But one way or another, writing things down, I think really sends a signal to the Lord that we care about what we're studying. Elder David A. Bednar taught, Recording what we learn and writing about what we think and feel as we study the scriptures is an invitation to the Holy Ghost for continued instruction. My third tip is to use a variety of techniques as you study the scriptures. I think that sometimes in our lives, we might feel like we're not getting a lot out of our scripture study because we don't know what to look for as we study. Throughout this course, I'll be giving lots of different scripture study tools like power phrases, connecting the scriptures to general conference, finding answers from the scriptures, and so forth. And my goal is to just teach and model some of these scripture study techniques so that your own personal scripture study can be strengthened. There's the old adage, give a man a fish, feed him for a day, teach a man to fish, feed him for a lifetime. My hope is that in this course, you'll learn lots of new study techniques that will help you in your personal scripture study. In this introductory class, I want to do three things. First, discuss the central theme of the Book of Mormon. Second, explore the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. And third, discuss how the Book of Mormon is the keystone of our religion. So let's start with the central theme in the Book of Mormon. You've probably written a paper where you had to have a thesis. And I think if we were going to look for Nephi's thesis, we would go to 1 Nephi chapter 6, verse 4. Here, Nephi says, The fullness of mine intent, everything I'm trying to do, is to persuade people to come unto the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, in other words, Jesus Christ, and be saved. The fullness of Nephi's intent is to invite us, persuade us, to come unto Christ. Even when he's quoting Isaiah, it's not just random. He says, I'm doing this that I might more fully persuade people to believe in the Lord, their Redeemer. Now, Nephi writes for over 100 pages. Do you think that by the end, he's decided to change topics? Absolutely not. In his final words, Nephi says, the words which I have written speak of Jesus and persuade people to believe in him. Nephi hands off the plates to Jacob. Do you think Jacob will take things in a new direction? Nope. He says, we labor diligently to persuade people to come unto Christ. We would to God that we could persuade all to believe in Christ. Then Jacob takes the sacred records and hands them to his son, Enos, who tells the story of his coming to Christ. And the small plates are passed from one generation to another. The last person to write on them is Amalekai, who ends his record saying, come unto Christ. And we could keep going. King Benjamin, Abinadi, both Alma the elder 
Alma the Younger, Helaman, who led the Stripling Warriors, his son Helaman, his son Nephi, Samuel the Lamanite, all testifying, come unto Christ. The pinnacle of the Book of Mormon is when Jesus Christ himself appears, and he says, come forth unto me, that ye may know that I am the God of Israel. The final narrators in the Book of Mormon don't change this thesis at all. Mormon, in some of his final words, says, believe in Jesus Christ. And Moroni ends his record saying, come unto Christ and be perfected in him. From beginning to end, there's this core emphasis in the Book of Mormon inviting us to come unto Jesus Christ. President Russell M. Nelson taught, as you read the Book of Mormon, I would encourage you to mark each verse that speaks of or refers to the Savior. Some people have done research to count the number of times the Savior is mentioned by name or title in the Book of Mormon, and they found it was nearly 4,000 times. But this actually undercounts the references to Jesus Christ, because if you're only looking for his names or titles, you'll miss pronouns. For example, consider Alma chapter 33, verse 22. A title, a reference to Jesus Christ, appears only once in this verse, the Son of God. But if we start counting the pronouns, He will come to redeem His people. He shall suffer and die to atone for their sins. He shall rise again from the dead. All people shall stand before Him. We see that there's actually six references to Jesus Christ in this verse. And so if we were to go and collect not just the titles of Jesus Christ, but also specific references to Him, including pronouns, we'd find there's more than 7,400 references to Jesus Christ. That's more than once per verse. That's a lot of focus on Jesus Christ. And that's why, although this course is called The Book of Mormon, A Masterclass, this is a course about Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is the central figure in the Book of Mormon. Now, the second thing I want to explore is the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. You probably know that when Joseph Smith was a young boy, he went to the Grove of Trees to pray and ask God which church he should join. He was told that he should join none of the churches, but that the Lord had a work for him to do. About three years later, part of this work became clear. When Joseph Smith was 17 years old, an angel named Moroni visited him. Joseph Smith said, the angel called me by name and said he was a messenger sent from the presence of God to me that his name was Moroni, that God had a work for me to do, and that my name should be had for good and evil among all nations, kindreds, and tongues, or that it should be both good and evil spoken of among all people. Pause for a moment and think about how amazing it is that that prophecy has been fulfilled. About 200 years ago, a farm boy in an obscure village said, an angel told me that in the future my name will be known all throughout the world. I remember a couple of years ago, I was living in a country where the church does not have a formal presence. It's not authorized for missionaries there. I was just sitting in a park and a man came up to me and he asked me where I was from. When I said I was from Utah, he said, oh, Utah, Joseph Smith. And I thought to myself, I am seeing Moroni's promise fulfilled right now. Now, I would not base my testimony on the fact that this prophecy was fulfilled, but I think it's one of those little interesting pieces of evidence that we'll talk about more in a little bit. So the angel Moroni told Joseph Smith that he should go and find some plates that contained an ancient record of the people who had lived in the Americas. The angel appeared to Joseph Smith a few more times over the next 24 hours. And so on September 22nd, 1823, Joseph went to the hilltop that Moroni had showed him and found the location where the plates were buried. Based on eyewitnesses' accounts, the plates were covered with ancient writings and bound together on one side by three rings. Each plate was about six inches wide, eight inches long, and thin. A portion of the plates appeared to be sealed so no one could read it. Joseph Smith did not immediately receive the plates, but over the next four years, the angel Moroni continued to visit with him, and finally on September 22, 1827, Joseph Smith took possession of the plates. Now, the whole topic of how the plates were translated is really important and interesting, and we'll focus on that in our next class. For now, we'll just say that the Book of Mormon was translated by the gift and power of God. Towards the end of the translation process, Joseph Smith learned that there would be some additional witnesses. One group of individuals who saw the plates was known as the three witnesses. 
In June of 1829, Joseph Smith led Oliver Cowdery, Martin Harris, and David Whitmer into the woods. As recounted in the volume Saints, this is what happened. They knelt and each took a turn praying to be shown the plates, but nothing happened. They tried a second time, but still nothing happened. Finally, Martin rose and walked away saying he was the reason the heavens remained closed. Joseph, Oliver, and David returned to prayer and soon an angel appeared in a brilliant light above them. He had the plates in his hands and turned them over one by one, showing the men the symbols engraved on each page. A table appeared beside him, and on it were ancient artifacts described in the Book of Mormon, the interpreters, the breastplate, a sword, and the miraculous compass that guided Nephi's family from Jerusalem to the Promised Land. The men heard the voice of God declare, These plates have been revealed by the power of God, and they have been translated by the power of God. The translation of them which you have seen is correct, and I command you to bear record of what you now see and hear. When the angel departed, Joseph walked deeper into the woods and found Martin on his knees. Martin told him he had not yet received a witness from the Lord, but he still wanted to see the plates. He asked Joseph to pray with him. Joseph knelt beside him, and before their words were half uttered, they saw the same angel displaying the plates and the other ancient objects. "'Tis enough, tis enough," Martin cried. Mine eyes have beheld, mine eyes have beheld. Note that the three witnesses saw an angel and they saw the plates, but they didn't physically handle them. A short time later, there was another group known as the eight witnesses that didn't see an angel, but Joseph Smith showed them the plates and they were able to feel them. In their testimony, they wrote, Joseph Smith has shown unto us the plates of which have been spoken and which have the appearance of gold. And as many of the leaves as the said smith has translated, we did handle with our hands, and we also saw the engravings thereon, all of which has the appearance of ancient work and curious workmanship. I'm fascinated by the fact that all three of the three witnesses left the church for a time, and three of the eight witnesses also left for a time. In other words, more than half of the witnesses at one time or another left the church. In the chart that I have on the screen, you can see I've got the age of the individual when they were one of the witnesses, and then the minus. A minus means they left the church. A plus means they stayed with the church. And a minus plus is they left the church and later came back. I can imagine that if Joseph Smith was playing a practical joke, he might have gotten a few people to go along with him. But once they left the church, once they were angry with Joseph Smith, it would be the perfect opportunity to get revenge and say, no, I was making the whole thing up. But none of these 11 witnesses ever denied their testimony of the Book of Mormon. To me, that's a powerful witness for its truthfulness. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Brother Hilton, this is so awesome. I love learning about the witnesses of the Book of Mormon. I wish I could read an entire book about the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. Wish granted. Throughout this course, I'll be highlighting pieces of scholarship for you, most of which are available for free online. This book, which I was a co-editor of, has lots of great chapters about different aspects of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, including the witnesses. For now, we'll just focus on two of those witnesses, David Whitmer and his brother John, one of the three and one of the eight. David Whitmer was a powerful leader in the church, and he moved to Independence, Missouri to help establish the church there. But in 1833, as mobs were persecuting the saints, he was the victim of a terrible event. At one point, a mob took David Whitmer and other church leaders and told them to bid their families farewell, for they would never see them again. Then, driving them at the point of the bayonet to the public square, they stripped and tarred and feathered them amidst menaces and insults. The commanding officer then called 12 of his men and ordering them to cock their guns and present them at the prisoner's breasts and to be ready to fire when he gave the word. He addressed the prisoners, threatening them with instant death unless they denied the Book of Mormon and confessed it to be a fraud, at the same time adding that if they did so, they might enjoy the privileges of citizens. Imagine that you are there. You're David Whitmer. If you were just joking about seeing an angel, now is the perfect time to take it all back. But that's not what David Whitmer did. Instead, he lifted his hands to heaven and he said, the Book of Mormon is the word of God. The mob let them go. Later in his life, David Whitmer believed that Joseph Smith was a fallen prophet and dissociated himself from the church, but he never denied his testimony of the Book of Mormon. In fact, towards the end of his life, there were some rumors that he had denied his testimony, and he even wrote an article in a newspaper to clarify the situation. 
He wrote, it has been represented that I denied my testimony as one of the three witnesses to the Book of Mormon. I have never at any time denied that testimony or any part thereof. I will say once more to all mankind that I have never at any time denied that testimony or any part thereof. I also testify to the world that neither Oliver Cowdery or Martin Harris ever at any time denied their testimony. They both died reaffirming the truth of the divine authenticity of the Book of Mormon. I was present at the deathbed of Oliver Cowdery, and his last words were, Brother David, be true to your testimony of the Book of Mormon. That's a powerful witness of the Book of Mormon. David's brother, John Whitmer, was one of the eight witnesses of the Book of Mormon. Like David, he held prominent positions in the church, including the church historian, but he also grew disaffected from the church. At one point in time, he was hanging out with members of mobs who had driven out the saints. And in a setting like this, he was asked about his testimony at the Book of Mormon. Can you see John Whitmer there? He's hanging out with his new buddies. This seems like if you're going to deny your testimony of the Book of Mormon, now's the perfect opportunity. But he didn't. Instead, he said, I now say I handled those plates. There were fine engravings on both sides. I handled them. He was the last of the surviving eight witnesses, and before he died, he said, I have never heard that any one of the three or eight witnesses ever denied the testimony that they have borne to the Book of Mormon as published in the first edition of the Book of Mormon. Think of it. Eleven men, upstanding in their community, honorable citizens, all said that they saw the Book of Mormon. Six of them, for a time at least, became disaffected from the church, but none of them ever denied their testimony. I think we can liken this to these sticks that you see on the screen. Any one of these sticks you could pick up and break in half, but if we bundled them together, that would be a lot harder to break. Throughout this course, we'll see lots of pieces of intellectual evidence that the Book of Mormon is what it claims to be, an ancient work written by ancient prophets. Now, these pieces of intellectual evidence, I think, are important. They're not the basis of our testimony, but I think of them like scaffolding for a building. The scaffolding isn't the actual building, but it can help things stay in place while the building is being constructed. In the same way, I think it's helpful for us to have intellectual pieces of evidence as we're constructing our own testimonies. I remember as a full-time missionary knocking on a door and being invited in, and the people started going off on all these things about the church that I had never heard of before. We might say that they were sharing intellectual evidence that the church wasn't true. I was really grateful at that time that I had a family members who had taught me some intellectual evidence about the Book of Mormon. So I had a scaffolding in place so I could take this new information I was getting and kind of sort things out, figure out what was right and what was wrong. As Austin Farrar taught, rational argument does not create belief, but it maintains a climate in which belief may flourish. I would never advocate for basing a testimony on intellectual evidence of the Book of Mormon, but I think this intellectual evidence, in this case, 11 witnesses, can help us as we're strengthening our testimony from a spiritual perspective. And ultimately, that spiritual perspective is what matters. At the end of the Book of Mormon, Moroni wrote, When you shall receive these things, I would exhort you that you would ask God, the Eternal Father, in the name of Christ, if these things are not true. And if you shall ask with a sincere heart, with real intent, having faith in Christ, he will manifest the truth of it unto you by the power of the Holy Ghost. And by the power of the Holy Ghost, ye may know the truth of all things. One of the most important things you and I can do is take Moroni up on this invitation. In my own life, I've come to gain a spiritual witness of the Book of Mormon, partly because at times I've prayed. I've done exactly what Moroni said, and I felt a spiritual witness that the Book of Mormon is God's word. Another way I've had a spiritual witness of the Book of Mormon is just by doing that serious study of it and feeling God's power flow into my life. Ultimately, I hope that this course will help you identify new intellectual evidences and even more importantly, strengthen your spiritual witness of the Book of Mormon as another testament of Jesus Christ. And that takes us to our final topic for today, the Book of Mormon as the keystone of testimony. Joseph Smith taught the Book of Mormon is the most correct of any book on earth and the keystone of our religion. And a person would get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts than any other book. There are lots of elements in our religion. If we imagine it as an arch, we could see priesthood, prophets, temple, and the Book of Mormon there in the middle as the keystone of our religion, the part of the arch that bears a double weight. Without the keystone, the entire arch would collapse. 
President Ezra Taft Benson explained that one of the ways the Book of Mormon is the keystone of our religion is that it's the keystone of testimony. Let's walk through an example and see how this is true. If the Book of Mormon is true, then I know that Heavenly Father lives and Jesus Christ is our Savior. That's clearly taught in the Book of Mormon. And if the Book of Mormon is true, then I know Joseph Smith was a true prophet, because why would a false prophet translate a true book? That doesn't make sense. And if Joseph Smith was a true prophet, then the church he restored is true, because why would a true prophet start a false church? That doesn't make sense. And if the church he started is true, then I know that it's led by a living prophet today, because why would you have a false prophet leading a true church? It all hinges on whether or not the Book of Mormon is the Word of God. No matter what doubt a person might have about the church, it can be resolved if that person deeply knows that the Book of Mormon is the Word of God. I saw this as a full-time missionary. My companion and I were teaching a woman named Jessica. She was a college student, and she readily accepted Joseph Smith as a prophet. She prayed about the Book of Mormon. But when we told her about the Word of Wisdom, she had a concern. She said, I don't drink alcohol and I don't smoke, but I do have a glass of green tea every day. And my doctor told me that it would be really healthy for me to drink it. Now, to be honest, I do not know anything about the health benefits of green tea. But I remember this idea of the Book of Mormon being the keystone of testimony. So I said, Jessica, what have you felt as you've prayed about the Book of Mormon? She said, well, I felt like it's the Word of God. What does that tell you about Joseph Smith? That he's a prophet. Well, Joseph Smith revealed the Word of Wisdom, which says we shouldn't drink tea or coffee. And she said, okay, I get it. I'll live it. And Jessica eventually was baptized. Now, I think if I had tried to argue with her about the medical benefits of green tea, I don't think things would have worked out very well. But because she had a foundational testimony of the Book of Mormon, she was willing to accept something, green tea, that might have otherwise been an obstacle for her. President Ezra Taft Benson said, The only problem a person has to resolve is whether the Book of Mormon is true. For if the Book of Mormon is true, then Jesus is the Christ, Joseph Smith was his prophet, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is true, and it is being led today by a prophet receiving revelation. Now, before we wrap things up, I just have one question for you. True or false? Joseph Smith taught that we would get nearer to God by studying the Book of Mormon than by any other book. I've asked this question to thousands of people. Usually about 90% get it wrong. Joseph Smith didn't say we would get nearer to God by studying the Book of Mormon. He said it would come as we abided by the precepts. This is an important point. It's good to read about the Book of Mormon. It's good to talk about the Book of Mormon. But ultimately, it's living the teachings that makes the difference in our lives. Like we saw earlier from the Doctrine and Covenants, church members need to remember the Book of Mormon not only to say, but to do according to what the Lord has written. Throughout this course, we'll cover lots of great information, just like we have today. But ultimately, I hope that you and I will do things with what we've learned. For today, here's an invitation that I'd like to leave with you. Spend some time thinking about your personal study of the Book of Mormon and make a specific plan of how you could begin or continue a serious study of this great book. I look forward to studying and learning more with you as we continue throughout this masterclass on the Book of Mormon.